Thank you once again for your singing this morning. We do live in tumultuous times, don't we? We turn on the news, it doesn't matter which station you really turn to. Uh, but we, we're hearing of crises of various sizes and, and shapes. Uh, if it's not a natural disaster, uh, be they hurricanes or wildfires, uh, it's the latest political st- scandal. If it's if it's not another COVID outbreak in a certain region, uh, it's yet another protest gone wild. Um, and so 2020 really has been a, a rocky year. And yet many historians tell us that really the 1960s was one of the most uh, significant eras uh, of Western civilization. The 60s was the decade of rebellion and anarchy. Uh, young people rebelled against really all forms of, of authority. They railed against the government. They decried big business. Uh, they voiced their displeasure concerning schools and military. It's no wonder that we're hearing such things today because the uh, the protesters of that era are the professors of this era. Uh, and so history does, in a sense, repeat itself. And yet during that era, one of the institutions that came under attack perhaps most vigorously and in conscientious was the institution of the family. In her book, Do You Believe in Magic? Uh, bringing the 60s back home, uh, Annie Gottlieb describes the 60s with rose-colored glasses. She, she views it as a, a great time in human history. And she described the time as this, as, it, as the generation that destroyed the American family. Listen to her chilling admonition. This is what she wrote. We might not have been able to tear down the state, but the family was close. We could not get we could get our hands on it. And we believe that the family was the foundation of the state, as well as the collective state of mind. We truly believe that the family had to be torn apart to free love, which alone can heal the damage done when the atom was be, was split to release energy. And the first step was to tear ourselves free from ourselves. I can imagine Dr. Phil sitting down with Penny Gottlieb and just asking her his iconic question, how's that working? How's that working for you? How are things looking today? Because tearing down the family never helped. It, it always hurts. It didn't work in the 60s. It's not working today. That's because the family is an essential building block of a healthy society. It is God's gift to humanity. That's why God addresses this specific issue in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, uh, the Lord Jesus, or sorry, God is is highlighting the the parent-child relationship and and demands that his people honor their parents. God demands that his people honor their parents. So open your Bibles and turn with me once again to Exodus chapter 20. This morning we're going to be examining the fifth commandment. In doing so, we're really shifting from one section of the Decalogue to another. In the first section, uh, God describes mankind's relationship with himself. So it's mankind's relationship with God Almighty. Uh, the second section, really beginning at verse 12 and then going to the end of verse 17, is going to concentrate on mankind's relationship with one another. So, what we sh- and yet what we should discover here is that God is not dealing with two completely separate categories. The reality is that God is sovereign over all things, over all areas. Uh, that his concern is not uh, merely or purely restricted to, to spiritual matters only in, in you know, verses 1 through 11. No, he focuses on human relationships here because his sovereignty expands to every aspect of human life. Here God focuses on these relationships the bond that exists between a parent and his or her child. 
and he does so because what happens in the family will impact everything. So as such, God demands that his people honor his name. Let's stand once again and read the Ten Commandments in their entirety. We'll begin from verse 1 and continue reading to the end of verse 17. This again is the, the word of the Lord. This is his law. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other God before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the father on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him uh, unpunished who takes his name in vain. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you shall, do no, you shall not do any work. You, your son, or your daughter, or your male or female servant, or, or your cattle, or, or the sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now let's reverse the commandment for today. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives. Verse 13. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. May the Spirit give us ears to hear and hearts to obey. Let's bow together. Father, we ask that you, would, that you would calm our troubled hearts and our anxious minds this morning. That you help us to, to concentrate on your word so that we might understand your will and live as you have called us to live. Help us to be attentive because you are our God. According to the psalmist, we are the people of your pasture. We are the sheep in your hand. And so we desire to to hear from you, to be instructed from you. And so speak to us. Make us attentive and obedient to your word so that you might receive all the honor and glory that you are doing. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. In some ways, the fifth commandment is relatively straightforward. It comes to us in two parts. Uh, it begins with the instruction, and then is followed by the incentive. That instruction is found in the in the initial clause. It states that we are to honor our father and our mother, uh, and then what follows in the remainder of the text is that incentive. It's that motivation. It's why we are to do these these things, uh, it's so that our days might be prolonged in the land. I think Al Mohler has, has rightly stated that we are far too comfortable with this command. It's really a parent's favorite dictum, isn't it? Because we believe in some ways that this text is addressed to children. Perhaps you you kind of piled your kids into the car this morning and you did so with a little spring in your step, uh, thinking, okay, kids, this, this one is for you. It's not. This is, it's not that God has suddenly changed directions mid -court. Really, that's, you know, the, the first four of the Ten Commandments, those were the, the adult commandments. And, and, and now he has really just 
stopped. He's, he's taken a pause, a, a break. He's, you know, he's called little Susie and, and Johnny up to the front for, you know, some children's work. Just, you know, a way to really to include the youngsters in the, in the larger scope of the commandment. That, that is not what's happening here. God is addressing the same audience. The same audience that he is commanded not to fashion idols. Same audience that he later tells they are not to commit adultery. The same audience that he tells you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or anything in your neighbor's house. The reality here is that this command is going to take over. It does apply to kings and toddlers, but the primary audience of this text is the adult. It's addressed to people like me who find themselves in, in a similar situation as I do. So I do say these things with a tremendous amount of fear and trepidation, uh, realizing he's in the audience this morning. So really, what does the text say? What does it say to the child who is 30 or 40 or 50 years of age? So God says, honor your father and your mother. And the word he hears is protect. You know, a number of years ago, an Episcopal church uh, published a, a number of answers that had been given in uh, some of their Sunday school classes. And the responses were wonderfully inaccurate. For example, one child described Noah's wife as Joan of Arc. Uh, someone was studying church history uh, and and suddenly exclaimed that the or, or told people it was a revelation to everyone around them that the Pope lives in the Vatican. Uh, somebody must have been studying the Book of Numbers as we were this morning because they claimed that Lot's wife was a, a pillar of salt by day and a, a ball of fire by night. Uh, you get on the implications of that, but anyway. Uh, but then at one point, some insightful youngster thought to to give the, you know, recite the Ten Commandments. And in coming to the Fifth Amendment, they said that we must humor our mother and our father. That is not the word that is being used, is it? The wording is actually tremendously specific. You'll notice that God doesn't tell us simply to obey our parents. He tells us to do something a far greater significance. Uh, something that encompasses more than than bare obedience, of, of just doing what we're told. We are to honor. The word that he uses here is uh, kaved. It, it, it literally means to, to be heavy. And, and like that Latin word gravitas, it can be applied uh, metaphorically in a, in a number of, of different ways. Uh, metaphorically in a sense of regarding someone as weighty. Rather than taking them lightly, such a person is to be held in high esteem. Uh, they are to be put on a, a pedestal as someone deserving respect and, and admiration. Uh, such an individual commands our attention. Uh, we should listen to and care for such a uh, person. And understanding how this law is applied in, in other places within the text, Calvin insists that, that honoring our, our parents involves three quite critical elements. Three things. Reverence, obedience, and gratitude. not a popular idea because we live in an age where youthfulness is is prized above all things we told that the, the youth are the hope of the future we're told really that those who've gone before us they, they've had their time uh, they've already run the course they've already done all that is that can be done We're told that they're the ones who have messed things up, and, and we're the ones that have to come along and, and clean it up. And so old age is seen as a burden. It's seen as something to be feared, to be despised. And yet these things ought not to be. 
that God demands that we honor our, our, our parents. That means that we cherish them. It means that we view them as God's gracious gift, recognizing that they have protected us and, and provided for us, even at the expense of their own hopes and dreams. Honoring our parents means that we actually take care of them. In 2004, the heat wave spread throughout uh, much of Europe. Al Moore tells us that approximately about approximately 15,000 elderly people died in France alone. And the news made headlines. It shamed the nation because the vast majority of those elderly people were, were left to die in their homes alone. They were Their bodies were left to wither while their, their children and grandchildren enjoyed an un, uninterrupted family vacation. Caring little about the parents or the grandparents they left behind. This was so significant that in 2007, uh, France enacted a law which prescribed by law that child that, that children are actually responsible. During his earthly ministry, the Lord Jesus confronted the Pharisees on a great uh, scope of different issues. In Matthew chapter 15 and then later in Mark 17, it's really recording the same event. Jesus denounces them as, as hypocrites. And he does so by pointing to the fifth commandment. These pious pretenders were meant to care for the own, their own, and yet they, they, de they declared to the parents what Whatever I have that would help you has been given to man, or given to God. They could use it. Uh, yes, it would be dedicated to God, but you know, as the administrators, they could partake of all these, these sorts of things, but mom and dad, this is, this is not for you. This Corban rule, as they called it, was a man-made tradition that directly violated the law that they proclaimed. Once again, we're reminded of Paul's comments in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And there he addresses the plight of the widow, claiming that it is her children's and grandchildren's responsibility to, to care for them. Uh, we're told that they are to practice piety in, in regard to their own family. And it's within this very context we, that we get that stark rebuke where, where Paul says, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he is worse than an unbeliever. And it's denied. So we need to care. Honoring them often means that we listen to them. It means seeking their advice and accepting their, their counsel because they've already faced those challenges, uh, that they've already traveled down long, life's long and, and rugged road. Uh, they've experienced the ups and downs, the twists and turns. They, they know the pitfalls to avoid. They only be arrogant and foolish who spurn such wisdom. Obviously, there, there are limits to a child's ability. Paul, Paul's counsel really still stands in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. He admonishes children to obey their parents. But he immediately follows that with a qualifier. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And so parents must be so honored. They must be obeyed. But at no time is their word to be a rival or to be a substitute for the word of God. Kevin DeYoung, the senior pastor at Christ Covenant Church, first came out of Kenya. He says this, if your parents command you to do what God forbids or forbids what God commands, you, you cannot and you must not obey your parents. You must. Of course, in saying these things, there is a fundamental assumption that is being made in the text. The text assumes that, that mom and dad have a valid role to play in the lives of, of their children. It implies that they are to teach and to discipline their sons and daughters. 
this instruction goes far beyond just telling them not to stick a fork in the, the electrical outlet, something I failed to grasp in my younger years. Don't know why. Um, it, it, it's, it means more than telling them really just to look both ways when crossing the street. No, the instruction that is meant here, implied here, is, is instruction which is eternal. We are to bring up our children in the training and admonition of the Lord. The home ought to be the first evangelistic crusade. It ought to be the first church. It ought to be the, the first Bible college or seminary. And this training regimen that is supposed to happen in the family, it, it is a continual process. Again, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God exhorts parents to, to carry out this duty when sitting in the house or when walking by the way. God says, you shall teach them diligently when you lie down and when you rise up. And mark it well, that, that obligation does not end when the child reaches 16 or 17 or 18 years of age. It doesn't end when the child leaves home or gets married and starts a family of their own. The fifth commandment assumes that a parent's ministry will continue throughout the course of one's life. Obviously, the type and tone of instruction, it is, it's going to change as the years progress. Uh, you know, no parent should you know, address their you know, 25-year-old daughter the same way they did when they were five years old. They shouldn't expect the same, same kind of response. They, they shouldn't barge into their home, bark orders, and, and expect really to be welcomed warmly. But they should remain involved. Continuously and consciously speaking into the lives of their children and their grandchildren. There should be a constant source of godly wisdom. That's the assumption that we make. Well, for those, of, for those of us on the receiving end, we should welcome that instruction. Why? Because there's an incentive given to us in the text itself. In the latter part of verse 12, we discover that this mandate is followed by a motive. The ancient reader is commanded to honor their parents so that their days might be prolonged in the land which the Lord their God gives them. Paul is going to repeat again this fifth commandment in, in the epistles to the Ephesians. And in, in some ways he seems to, to broaden uh, the incentive. He says, honor your father and mother so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And within this new context, it seems reasonable to ask, you know, how, are the, how does the treatment of our parents, how does it connect, how does it coincide with this, this idea of a long life? And Dwayne Garrett, who's a prof at Southern Baptist uh, Theological Seminary, he, he, he suggests that the answer is found in the fact that parents are first and foremost, the, the first and foremost authority structure of life. This is what he, he says those who respect their parents will not have trouble dealing with another authority in life, be it in government, business, the military, or society in general. From a habit of respecting parental authority, one learns that there are rules that govern life, and that there are people who rightly are rightly in positions to enforce the rules. Such a person will respect law school rules and company policies as well as the police, teachers, and employers. He will not have in his company file that notation has problems with authority. And there is less like, therefore less likely to be therefore less likely to be fired. He will not be expelled from university or, or disorderly behavior or cheating. And more generally such a person will understand the rules that govern all of life and will not use such things as trying to drive a car while intoxicated. In short, those who out of their relationship to their parents learn respect for authority, they avoid the calamities that befall people who do not, and so are far more likely to be healthy, at peace, and to live well. Now, don't get me wrong, study up the study base. It doesn't matter if the study is liberal, it doesn't matter if it's conservative. 
but they showed that perhaps the greatest predictor of one's health, of one's success, the greatest predictor is what happened to him. Our success depends on how our parents relate to us and how we relate to them. And yet I think as we look at this text, as we seek to understand the fifth commandment, we should not overlook the, the spiritual dynamic that is at, at play here. Uh, that th- this horizontal plane is really impacted or impacts our relationship uh, with the Lord. You see, the Exodus incentive here was meant to remind the, uh, the Jewish reader of this fact, uh, of that twofold dimension. It reminds them if, if the parents did their job of, of passing on the faith from one generation to the next, and if children honored their parents by listening and accepting that instruction, God would bless his people. That they'd enjoy a right relationship. Avoiding both the, the immorality and the, the idolatry of the surrounding nations. But if they stop, if they forsook the faith of their forefathers, they were headed to danger. In that case, they would not live long in the land that the Lord had had to them. Unfortunately, we find that that is exactly what happened. In Ezekiel chapter 22, the prophet reveals that the Babylonian captivity was caused, at least in part, by the fact that the rulers of Israel, they treated their fathers and mothers lightly. The term that's being used there is actually the exact opposite of the word for honor. Honor is kaved, that means uh, to be weighty, to love, the word that's being used here means to be. They did precisely what God told them not to do. Unfortunately, what we find happening on a, on a grand scale, on a collective scale, is, is also what happens on an individual uh, basis in Scripture as well. We find that Scripture is littered with examples of those who dishonored of their parents, and the result is always tragic. Jacob would deceive his father, leading to a a sibling rivalry that has lasted for centuries. It has lasted throughout the ages. Samson rejects the the advice of his father and mother when when seeking to marry a woman from Timah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Things didn't go well with her. It didn't go well with the harlot in the next chapter. It didn't go well with the lion in the next chapter. Absalom led a coup against David, resulting in his death and the death of countless others. Rehoboam uh, despises the policies of his father, of, of Solomon, the wisest man who ever walked the face of the earth except for Jesus himself. He forsakes the counsel of the elders, trusting instead the young men that have grown up. He divided what was the richest, perhaps the most powerful nation that was on the face of the earth. Brothers and sisters, we trust that we will not be so reckless or arrogant. We must honor our parents because God demands it. He does so in, in both the Old and New Testament. We find that what's, what's stated here in Exodus chapter 20 and repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is repeated for us in, in Ephesians 6 and Colossians chapter 3. So this instruction here is, is binding. We must honor our parents so that we might learn both by precept and practice how to love the Lord our God and how to walk in all of his ways and to hold fast to him. So love your parents. Spend time with them. Uh, thank them and, and praise them uh, for their past and present ministry to you and your children. Uh, forgive them for any wrongs they've committed. Uh, apologize for your own indiscretion. Heed their counsel. 
obey their instructions, that you may lead a long and happy life. That is what God demands. That's the pattern that was set forth by Christ himself. He was the one who humbled himself by being obedient to the Father's will, a will that drove him to the point of death, even the death on the cross. He did this so that you and I might have long uh, have life, not, not just a long life, but an abundant life, an eternal life. He died so that we might be set free to, to follow in his footsteps, to, uh, to imbibe his example and to experience God's richest blessings. And that path includes the fifth commandment. We must honor our Let's do so. Let's pray together. God in heaven, Father, we thank you for this instruction this morning. We thank you for the reminder. We thank you for our parents. Father, whether they, whether they believe, be believers or not, Father, we recognize that you, by your sovereign will, brought them, brought us in this, in this sense into their life. That you placed us in that particular situation. That we might learn and grow. Father, eventually, somehow, that we might be drawn to you. And so, Father, we thank you for their ministry. Father, we ask that you would bless them, that you would uphold them. Father, that you would give them boldness to speak into our lives. Father, that you would give us the ability to hear that and to, uh, to, to weigh that and, and to put that in practice in our own particular circumstances. Father, help us to know how to minister to our people. And to bless them as they should be blessed. And Father, in doing so, that we would be a, a testimony of, of your goodness and grace towards us in a world that does not reflect. Help us to show them that. Hey, help us to show them how you make us different. How you inform us and guide us and follow with those tremendous things. We ask this so that you may be honored and glorified in all. Benediction comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you. Thanks for coming, brothers and sisters. We'll see you again. Thank you.